Welcome to Tuesday Cafe with Sean Canan, and we are broadcasting live on March 7th from the studios of WMNF Tampa. We have a special show today. It's all about the political changes that were happening in 1964 and the Beatles in Florida that year. It was a period of musical, cultural, and political change, and somehow the Beatles were in the middle of it all. We'll talk about that this hour. And as a reminder that if you like the Beatles, WMNF is organizing a tribute to the Beatles on March 25th. You can get tickets at WMNF.org. And I want to thank everyone who supported this Tuesday Cafe and the WMNF in our recent membership drive. It's great to have listener sponsors like you. You can still contribute at WMNF.org. Well, it's a huge news day here in Florida and in the Tampa Bay area. The city of Tampa elections are today. It's also the first day of the Florida legislative session. We'll hear all about that later in the day. This hour, I kind of wanted to, to uh, turn off your mind, relax, and float downstream, and we'll talk about the Beatles this hour. Later on in the show, we're going to be joined by Harlan Brown. He's the curator of Penny Lane, the ultimate Beatles museum in Dunedin in Pinellas County. He'll talk about some Beatles memorabilia from their Florida visits. And Bob Keeling's new book is called Good Day Sunshine State, How the Beatles Rocked Florida. It's published by the Uni University Press of Florida. And I want to thank you for coming on WMNF's Tuesday Cafe, Bob. Hey, Sean, good morning. Thanks so much for having me. Sorry, I, I had your mic off. So thanks so much for coming on. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Sean. I'm really glad you could join us. So the Beatles first came to Florida in February of 1964, and we're going to talk about that for sure, but let's back it up a bit to late 1963. Set the scene for us, if you don't mind, with the mood of the country and the mood of Florida with the historical events like the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Uh, let's start with that. Sure, Sean, and... and um... It, it was a privilege during the course of, of writing this book to interview people who were actually there. I have more than 30 primary source interviews. For instance, the Life magazine team that came down and traveled with the Beatles, took that iconic picture of them in the swimming pool on Biscayne Bay that ended up being an iconic Life magazine cover. But to your question, interviewing Gail Cameron, who is the correspondent for Life, she talked about having been at the epicenter of Camelot back in the day. She knew Jackie very well. And she and her team had just come out of this mind numbing coverage of, of this just devastating assassination of a young president and the end of Camelot. So the Beatles, in her estimation, not just mine, represented the country being able to smile again, to be able to you know laugh again, you know uh, the Beatles' first huge hit in America, "I Want to Hold Your Hand," came out right about Christmas time of '63, and it was just a watershed event. So you're right, this does there is some the, some pristine action to 1964 that really sets the stage for this huge um, coming to America that the Beatles had that year. And it wasn't just Camelot and the, the death of JFK. It was also the Cuban Missile Crisis, which especially here in Florida, really uh, affected the mood of people in the country and in Florida. That's a great point. I mean, you think about it down in Key West, they actually had missiles pointed towards Cuba just 90 miles away. And, and uh, you know, that's, that's pretty heavy stuff. And you also had the ongoing civil rights issues going going on throughout the south and certainly here in florida and that's a big part of of uh the book as well so yeah florida was really a pot boiler in 64 and the years leading up to it and i think that's part of the reason why this is such a meaty story because there was so much going on and we'll certainly get to what happened in St. Augustine and in other parts of Florida for the civil rights movement. As we go through the, the interview, I want to let people know to, to remind you that you're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, broadcasting live from the studios of WMNF Tampa. My guest right now is Bob Keeling. His new book is called Good Day Sunshine State, How the Beatles Rocked Florida. And in 1963, before the Beatles got here, before Beatlemania, 
the Beatles hit it big in, in England, but those familiar songs that were very popular in England in 63, like Please Please Me, they kind of flopped at first in the U.S. They did. There's no question about it. She Loves You is another one that came out on the Tiny Swan label. And there's, I, I, I remember watching this clip from American Bandstand of all shows. And Dick Clark shows a picture of the Beatles in 63 to the Teeny Bopper girls, and they kind of laugh at him. And She Loved You kind of sunk like a stone until the convergence of, of all of the things that happened in 64. And then when all these songs came out, of course, they were monster hits. But yeah, and George Harrison coming to visit his sister in the Midwest and being a complete unknown in 1963, towards the end of it. Uh, it's amazing how quickly everything shifted, Sean. And you mentioned earlier about it around Christmas time is when I Want to Hold Your Hand was released. And one of the things that may have impacted why that one became a hit while She Loves You and Please Please Me didn't in the United States, at least, was this gigantic at the time $50,000 promotional budget that the record label spent on promoting I Want to Hold Your Hand. How big of a deal was that? Enormous absolutely enormous it was just this perfect storm this confluence of events and and certainly brian epstein being astute enough to realize okay i don't have to break the bank with the fee for the beatles to be on ed sullivan but we know that is the television program to get them on in america so you you had just this perfect storm really of publicity of the nation being ready this new um, influential band and make no mistake before the Beatles, nobody from England, not Cliff Richard, nor anyone else had made any sort of a dent in America. So, you know, what the Beatles did was unprecedented coming here and storming the shores and having the number one hit with, I want to hold your hand and then just blowing up into the stratosphere that spring, you know, it was just, you know, uh, uh, but that that advertising campaign was absolutely crucial. And we'll see that, of course, as I mentioned earlier, we'll talk about the civil rights movement later on in the show. But um, I want to kind of um, make a point about how the Beatles music was kind of crossing over to a wider audience. You introduce us to this young woman at the time, a high school student named Kitty Oliver. What was life like for her in, I think it was in West Jacksonville before she heard the Beatles on WAPE AM? What was life like for a young black woman? She, she described it as basically like apartheid. And there were certain parts of the city you just, you didn't go to, they called them zones of uncertainty. And it, it, it just underscores uh, the divisions back then. And, and I'll tell you, Sean, there's no way to have written this book about spotlighting the African-American story as well and how the Beatles were agent change and progress uh, on that front as well. But Kitty saw pictures of them, uh, Beatles, uh, embracing little Richard, literally. And we think, okay, so what? But back then, you know, white artists embracing uh, an African-American performer was a big deal in the pre-civil rights era. So it shows, again, just how this, this was such a crucial era. And to hear it from Kitty Oliver's point of view, as a young, you know, a teenager from Jacksonville, it showed how the Beatles had this mass appeal uh, across genres and uh, across ethnicities as well. All right, so we've set the stage for what the what the country was like before Beatlemania, but then the, the Beatles flew to New York and then they they uh, were on the Ed Sullivan show in February in New York. And it was the most watched show ever. And then that led to the following uh, later that month when the Beatles flew from New York to Miami. Uh, Ringo was a typical clown on that flight. Uh, he was worried about sharks. He put on a life jacket. What was uh, going to Miami from New York? What was that like for the Beatles? Yeah, I described Sean is, is Miami is where the Beatles fell in love with America. You know, coming to Florida for the first time beaches, palm trees, um, sunshine, warm weather, even, even in the winter, beautiful, shapely, tanned young women. You know, this was paradise for the Beatles. Paul McCartney even said so. He said, we'd never seen palm trees before. 
So, uh, you know, this is where the Beatles really got the sense of everything America had to offer. They weren't just prisoners in their hotel room the way they were in New York. They got out. You know, they went on dates. They met a young, brash Cassius Clay. So uh, you know, there's just so much uh, more to the story of the Beatles in Florida. Ed Sullivan's grandson even even told me in an interview, he said, you know, the Beatles' chance to really show off their personalities much more near the Sunshine State than in New York, where they were practically prisoners because they were just set upon by thousands and thousands of fans. So it's it's a nice contrast. And coming to Florida was really where America opened up to them almost like a flower. Our guest is Bob Keeling. His new book is called Good Day, Sunshine State, How the Beatles Rocked Florida. I'm Sean Canan. This is Tuesday Cafe. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF Tampa. Well, there were thousands of fans, uh, just like in New York, there were thousands of fans that greeted them at the Miami airport. Uh, describe the scene there and uh, uh, what it looked like and what it felt like to be uh, amid that crowd at the Miami airport. I was lucky enough to interview several people who were there, including a young radio newsman by the name of Larry Kane, who is this, even at 21 years old, he's this serious tough guy reporter who's down there. And he's like, what? what? I've got to interview some teeny bopper band I've never heard of. I've got to cover this. What are you talking about? But all of a sudden, when he's at the airport and the Beatles come in and there is such a crush of fans trying to see them up in the terminal, they're pressing against the windows so hard, they actually push out the glass and it falls onto the tarmac and it, it, you know, it, it, it bursts into a thousand pieces. And all of a sudden Larry realizes, okay, this is a real story. And that was the beginning of his years long relationship with the Beatles. So right away, he got the sense that, wow, okay, this is something different. There are young women just, you know, showing unbridled enthusiasm, screaming. And, you know, young girls didn't do that in 64. He started to see how they were really um, such agents of change here in America. So uh, it was quite the uh, entry into America, into Florida on uh, February 13th of 1964. And Gail Cameron, the reporter I told you about from Life magazine, was in the motorcade. And she told me she had this moment of clarity, like, my God, this is just amazing. You know, she knew as well, having already covered Beatles earlier in New York, that's like, this is a watershed moment. And I am right in the middle of it. So it was a real privilege to interview these primary source folks who were right there at ground zero when all this happened. And the Beatles did have freedom, a little bit more freedom in Miami Beach than in New York, as you said. In their first night out in Miami, they saw they, they got the chance to see American music. So uh, they saw bands like the Coasters, H Hank Ballard and the Midnighters and the BJ Ramblers. Why was that important for the Beatles to kind of uh, expose themselves to this American music that they'd only heard on records to that point? Because they worship these folks. I mean, they were in the mood. You know, the bands you talked about, you know, songs like Yak Yak and things like that, those were those were anthems for them. You know, these guys weren't just musicians, they were fans. So, you know, that was a big deal. And and fortunately their bodyguard, Sergeant Buddy Dresner of the Miami Beach Police Department was um, sympathetic to their desire to get out and see America. And he became such a principal figure in this story, kind of being the father figure, the protector, the big brother, but yet he had a great sort of a, a wonderful way about him, you know, to be able to offset the tension with humor. And he said, you know, listen, guys, you got to do what I say or I'm going to be on midnights forever. You know, so uh, Buddy becomes a big uh, figure in this as well. And he was able to provide the protection for them to get out as they wanted. And when the fans started to swamp them, he knew instinctively, OK, it's time to cut and run. And that's what he do. Well, since we're talking about Buddy Dressner, the bodyguard, the, the Miami police officer, um, there's he he may play into a couple of song lyrics for the Beatles. The Beatles saw Don Rickles um, with Buddy Dressner, their bodyguard. Could a line from She Came In Through the Bathroom Window have gotten its origins there when the Beatles saw Don Rickles? I don't think there's any question about it. They're all sitting down at the club at the, at the uh, Deauville Hotel, 
and Buddy even says in this interview that his son Barry has with him, you know, oh God, they stat us right down in the front. And I knew Rickles was just going to destroy us. And sure enough, he comes out, he looks at us, he, he sees the quote unquote mop heads. Then he sees the policeman with him and he's like, what are you doing here? Go get a job, cop. Go get a steady job. And if you remember the the line from the song, she came in through the bathroom window. It's like, so I joined the police department and got myself a steady job. And uh, that is absolutely attributed to uh, their time with the good sergeant from Miami Beach PD. So there's another uh, possibility as well that they watched a lot of television when they were um, kind of seeking refuge in their hotel rooms and they watched some old uh, old space kind of shows. Could a line from Bungalow Bill be related to Buddy Dressner, the police officer that was guarding the Beatles in Miami Beach? Yes, yes. There's another one where uh, in, in Bungalow Bill, you know, as they're watching this um, cartoon, the figure in it is, you know, he's got his ray gun and he's he's uh, zapping things on there. And that's what Buddy said. Boy, I wish I could just zap and make the you know, bad guys, the bank robbers go away and things like that. And one of the things I really cherished was getting into the hard rock collection and seeing a, and, and holding a four page letter from Paul McCartney to Buddy as a thank you letter. And one of the things he says at the end is zap, you know, just Buddy had talked about while they're all hanging out watching TV. And if you remember, uh, Paul used that line in Hard Day's Night as well zap you know like that so that that became another of their catchphrases as a result of their visit to the sunshine state another song that they were working on was can't buy me love on a yacht ride in biscayne bay there was a piano on the yacht and paul played a little bit of piano of that new song can't buy me love that's right uh there are several songs that they worked on um while they were there and uh can't buy me love had started uh, at the hotel george v in paris when they were there in January. Um, you Can't Do That was a rollicking um, song from John that ended up on Hard Day's Night. He even played lead guitar on it. <clears throat> John also received uh, delivery on a brand new Rickenbacker guitar there that he nicknamed Miami because he uh, took delivery on it at the Deauville Hotel. So it was just, it, it really was like um, part holiday, you know, part work. And needless to say, it was very memorable because uh, the Beatles actually got to go out and see what America was like. And one of the things they got to do was go to their bodyguard's house, a little policeman's house in North Miami Beach and have their first ever home cooked American meal. So that's just another wonderful little moment that, uh, you know, is described in the book. And you mentioned just a minute ago when they were writing, you can't do that in uh, in Miami Beach. It's notable that the only Beatle wife or girlfriend who went to Miami was Cynthia Lennon. So what was her interaction like with John and with the rest of the entourage? And um, could you can't do that have led to a little uh, could could that those lyrics be somewhat about the resentment that John felt a little bit stifled by that and that Paul had a lot of freedom? It does make you wonder. Another one of the songs I think um, was also written down there, at least partially, was their beautiful ballad, If I Fell, which basically is about um, them singing about an affair that they're contemplating. And it does make you wonder where John's mind was at. But to her credit, you know, Cynthia isn't someone who ever sought out the spotlight. She was this beautiful you know, just a um, lovely, demure woman. Buddy Dresner loved her as well and even pointed that out to one of the reporters in Miami. She wasn't looking to try to become famous as well through her husband's reflected spotlight, not at all. And nor was she a minor character in this saga because after all, you know, she was dating John in art school back before anybody knew who he was. And even... Uh, stayed with him after you know he hit her during a particularly violent argument so you know she's she's an important person to this story but in Miami I think it was a chance for her to enjoy all the sacrifices that she'd put in on behalf of her husband being the perpetual lady in waiting while he's out performing so I, I was really glad to include her in the story she's an important person in this in this era of the Beatles
Bob Keeling's new book is called Good Day Sunshine State, How the Beatles Rocked Florida. I'm Sean Canan. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. Well, to contrast how big the Beatles had become versus where, where they started in uh, just a few months earlier, while they were in Miami on Saturday, February 15th, 1964, Meet the Beatles LP went to number one on the charts. I Want to Hold Your Hand was still the number one single that week as well. So they were they were becoming huge. Finally, you know, it seems like they'd been big in, in Britain for a while, but now in the United States, guaranteed uh, superstars. For the Sunday night Ed Sullivan performance, there were actually empty seats and a bomb threat on February 16th at the Deauville Hotel in the Miami in Miami Beach. Well, what was that all about? It was because this was such a challenge to get this thing staged. Um, you know, you have a working beach resort. You have all of these lighting and electrical demands, and it's putting this huge drain on the uh, power grid at the Deauville Hotel. And uh, at some point, with all of this chaos going on, Buddy barely gets the Beatles back in time for showtime. And it's just, you know, they're trying to get fans in and see it. It's just chaos. And, it, and at some point, the producers of the show say, OK, this is it. We got to shut the doors. And that left a lot of unhappy fans still waiting out there. So yeah, compared to the Ed Sullivan Theater, where there were many more controls, I mean, this was Thunderdome down there in, in South Florida trying to stage this thing. And I think that's an interesting point as well. This was a much more challenging production than their first go around in New York City. Yeah, you know, live national program just broadcasting from the ad hoc studios of a of a hotel ballroom. So let's hear a little bit about of this. I think the very last song in their set was "I Want to Hold Your Hand." So here is Paul's a silly intro, intro to, that, to that, and just a few seconds of the song from the Ed Sullivan Theater in Miami, Miami Beach in 1964. You're listening to WMNF Tampa. We'd like to finish off this bit with a song which has always been a great favorite of ours. This is one that was recorded by our favorite American group, Sophie Tucker. <laughs> That's the Beatles performing live in Miami Beach in 1964 on the Ed Sullivan Show, broadcasting from the Deauville Hotel in Miami Beach. You're listening to T Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting from WMNF in Tampa, and my guest is Bob Keeling. His new book is called Good Day, Sunshine State, How the Beatles Rocked Florida. And Bob, you talk about the Beatles' three stages, innocence, influence, and activism, well, we, you know, the innocence and influence we've we've kind of gotten to, but um, in your book, in Florida, really, in 1964, the Beatles kind of was were making that transition to activism. After Ed Sullivan, the Beatles decided they wanted to stay just for a short vacation in Miami Beach. They met Cassius Clay, who, of course, we all know as Muhammad Ali. Why didn't the Beatles meet Sonny Liston, who was the champ? Because Sonny Liston, did, he said, I, I don't have time for those sissies. And uh, Cassius Clay did, and they met him. And, uh, you know, the rest is history. Um, interviewing Robert Lipsight from the New York Times, who was with them in Ali's locker room or Clay's locker room, he was the only person there when the two, you know, when the Beatles and Clay actually met. And he describes what a mesmerizing <laughs> event that was. You know, here are these little guys from England. All of a sudden, here comes this six foot three chiseled Adonis who uh you know is an African-American was somebody who wasn't afraid to speak up and speak his mind and arguably he became absolutely as big a cultural figure as the Beatles did uh, back then and uh, neither Ali nor Beatles and were then impressed just with the other Beatles team at the proper North American tour I think we're talking over each other because of a, a little bit of an internet uh, issue. But ne when the Beatles met Muhammad Ali, neither one were impressed with the other. No, I wouldn't. I, yeah, I mean, they kind of put on this slapstick thing that John wasn't real happy about. And Clay didn't really know who they were. And, um, it was still a little bit too soon, but both became 
just enormous figures in American culture, not long after. And uh, Ali was, of course, influenced by the Nation of Islam and Malcolm X, and in, uh, starting around then, and he was in, he lived in segregated Overtown, so he was kind of at this point fed up with with really with uh, racial segregation, just as the Beatles would soon become, or at least be more vocal about. And around this time is when John Lennon asked the bodyguard, the cop Buddy Dressner why the US was in Vietnam. So these weren't really um, very big questions that were happening in the culture in 1964 necessarily, but already John Lennon was thinking about questions like this and was asking his American friend, this policeman, about the US war in Vietnam. Yeah, and it shows, so was Paul. Uh, in his letter to Buddy that I mentioned, he said, yeah, I hope to see you again in Jacksonville in September if we don't you know, escalate this war in Vietnam, that is. So yeah, the Beatles in their early 20s are already showing a developing worldview, considerable intellectual curiosity. And uh, that was that was reflected in their times in Florida. And we're going to transition out of Miami Beach to the other uh, times that the Beatles went to Florida in 1964 in just a moment. But let me ask you this one last anecdote about Miami. Why did George miss curfew when he was when he went out late in Miami? He uh, was out. He was out. At the right. time, so he decides to take a ride along the beach with Buddy's permission. He, he was with um, their publicist to kind of question them, see what's going on. And uh, George didn't come in until one in the morning, and Buddy was furious till he found out what had happened. So the 1964 summer tour, jumping ahead a few months from when the Beatles were in Miami Beach in February of 1964, just included three dates in the southeastern United States, Jacksonville, which we'll talk about, New Orleans, and Dallas. So was that because of Brian Epstein's contract rider that indicated that the Beatles would only play if the audiences were integrated, that he would not play to, uh, to segregated stadiums? That certainly seems like a fair question. It, it seems like a fair assumption, given the fact that we're not, we haven't had the Civil Rights Act passed yet until July of that year. But there were some events that happened in Florida that, that helped hasten that event happening too. So the Beatles are just at the forefront. And fortunately, Larry Kane, the My Newsman I mentioned, went along with them on tour at their invitation. And Larry is the one asking these significant questions to people like Paul, who in Las Vegas, he asks him, you know, what happens if the Gator Bowl is segregated? And Paul, who some people think, oh, you know, he's the winking, happy guy. He's going to smooth everything over. He's like, no, you know, we, we, we don't we don't segregate against we against what they called color people at the time. He said, I wouldn't mind if someone sat next to me and it's just very foreign to us. We don't get it. And uh, that's when they basically drew the line in the sand. Said, if it is segregated, we're not going to play there. Yeah, Ringo said that as well. He wouldn't that that Beatles wouldn't yep. play segregated venues. Paul described it as mad that about segregation in the U.S. Um, and and this this journalist you mentioned, Carol, Larry Kane, who was in Miami Beach and who was following them on the early stages of the the U.S. tour that we're talking about right now, Las Vegas, San Francisco. He his reports are going out to radio stations all over the country. So we're hearing this activism by the Beatles on all over the country, they're learning about that the Beatles won't play these segregated stadiums. And in San Francisco in the first date, John Lennon criticized the US being in Vietnam to this reporter Kane. And so these reports went out all over the country. Thankfully, Larry was there because he's a real newsman's newsman. To this day, you can still follow him on Twitter. He's still you know, very active. But back then, he's asking these thought provoking questions as opposed to some of these DJs who no offense to them, but they're like, wow, look at your long hair. And do you get a chance to date girls while you're over here? No, Larry is asking very deep, penetrating questions. And uh, John Lennon is, is appreciative of that because it gets to show their developing worldview. And they get to be the agents of change that they obviously want to be because they're being asked questions that 
appeal to their developing worldview. So it, it's a lot of credit to, to Larry Kane. He was on that tour asking the questions and they, they weren't hesitating what meant to answer. So let's go back to Florida then. In St. Augustine, there were civil rights marches. It was the upcoming one of the big anniversaries for the oldest city in the country. And so there were marches there because the there were no Black people included in the official celebrations. And so there were a lot of civil rights marches. There was also Klan violence against these marches. And eventually, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was arrested in St. Augustine. He was jailed there and then jailed in Jacksonville. So King was in solitary in Jacksonville protesting the, the civil rights of abuses here in Florida, but uh, a federal judge kind of ruled that uh, the, the, the Klan and the others and the police were in the wrong and the protesters were in the right. Tell us more, what, what gaps am I leaving out about what was happening in St. Augustine and other parts of Florida regarding civil rights at the time? All right, I'm not hearing you, Bob. What I might recommend is if you can, uh, if you can mute, uh, sorry, hide your video. That might. Hey, Sean, are you there? Yeah, there you there are. You if you hide me. your video, it might increase your bandwidth to your audio. Okay. All right, let's try that. Um, we're talking about Dr. King and Judge Brian Simpson, who's just an enormous figure in in the whole movement towards civil rights and. Uh, Judge Simpson actually took testimony from Dr. King in Jacksonville. And the one thing I'm particularly proud of is, is to have found a certain confluence between the Beatles and Dr. King, where just weeks apart, it turns out they were next to each other. And they were speaking out in their own way towards uh, you know, what they wrong with they decide. So a lot was happening there. And uh uh, Judge Simpson is a pivotal figure. He was a, a Truman appointee, and some of his rulings. Bob is coming in and out as with his audio. So what I'm going to do right now is um, we're, the Beatles were diverted from Jacksonville. Be, uh, I'll we're you'll find out why in a bit. Starting the but, um, they were diverted to Key West, and we're going to talk about Key West in just a little bit. We'll bring Bob back on, but right now, let's continue on to Jacksonville. The there was the, the Jacksonville concert that happened in September, September 11th of 1964. And what I want to do right now is bring on our next guest to talk about the Jacksonville concert before we go back to Bob. They, um, he, our next guest can describe a ticket from that Jacksonville show, oh, which is which in is the museum that we're going to talk about. Joining me and Bob right now is Harlan Brown. He's the curator of the Penny Lane Ultimate Beatles Museum in Dunedin. Welcome to Tuesday Cafe on WMNF, Harlan. Good morning. This is so fascinating. I can't wait to read the book. Um, thanks, Bob. Um, and thanks, Brad. Um, uh, Penny Lane has um, a huge collection of memorabilia. And uh, one of the things that we were talking about was the ticket from Jacksonville on se uh, September 11th. It's a well-worn um, reserved seating ticket. And um, it's from uh, the uh, WAPE, the, the Big Ape. And, and attached to it also is um, uh, an ad from a local newspaper. And if I, I'm gonna try and move over to where the ticket is in the cabinet, and, and, I hope and while, it doesn't. while you're doing that, I want to remind listeners that we're listening on radio, of course, and you can't see this live, but I will put the video up on WMNF.org later. So if you want to see the ticket and some of this other memorabilia, you can go later today and beyond to WMNF.org. And so right now, Harlan is showing us a ticket for the Beatles in, in Jacksonville, September 11th, 1964. So Harlan, describe what people would be seeing. Well, this is this is a, a, a ticket stub. It's got a very faded, uh, four faded images of the Beatles on the ticket and a big ape. Um, and as I said, it's a reserve seating ticket, which was five dollars. 
And uh, that's one thing that people find amazing when they come into the museum is how uh, the ticket prices were. Uh, and that was big bucks back then. Um, and the, uh, the ad, I don't know what newspaper it's from, but it's uh, also attached with the, uh, with the ticket stub. And we also have ticket stubs from um, the San Francisco show, um, which was their last live performance. Um, and we have lots of memorabilia. Harlan, I'm going to let's see if we can bring Bob back in, because I definitely one of the important keys of 1964 is when the Beatles were diverted from Jacksonville right before the show. The show in Jacksonville also was was not it wasn't just race relations and segregation that might have de derailed that show. There was also a weather event. And so, Bob, if you're back with us, what can you uh, say? What happened? Why did the Beatles get diverted from Jacksonville and where did they go? Yeah. Uh. I, I hope you can hear me okay, because uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, just watching the video tour of Arlen's amazing collection there. That That is fantastic, and it's nice to know it's here in Florida. Yeah, the Beatles had just come out of Montreal doing a show there, and Ringo had gotten a death threat. You know, some anti-Semitic groups, and he's like, well, I, I'm not Jewish, but uh, they certainly took it seriously. And so they decide we're not going to stay in Montreal and they're going to fly all night to the next gig, which is Jacksonville. But as you mentioned, there was Hurricane Dora was about to storm ashore. So Larry Kane told me, he goes, yeah, it was my idea to divert to Key West. And so they land this enormous plane on this giant, you know, in this little runway in Key West at three in the morning. And here's all these kids waiting. There's people standing on the roof. And uh, the Beatles had arrived back in Florida at the Key Western Motel. But it was, yeah, it was hunkering down from Dora. And just fortunately, they had a couple of days in between gigs. So it worked out pretty well in terms of timing and logistics. And one of the things that uh, they stayed at a hotel that was right near the Key West airport called the Key Wester. And it was notable that in 1964, um, this might not have happened in other places in Florida, but hotel white hotel guests and Ringo Starr swam with the opening artists for the Beatles, which they were a, quite a number of them were young black women. This was something that kind of was a little bit um, verboten in uh, parts of the South in this in 1964. Yeah, another one of the people I was lucky enough to interview was a, was a former sailor named John Trusty, who the and he talked about going out there and seeing Ringo in the pool with these beautiful young women from the Excel with a white musician. He was sort of taken aback, even though he was a very progressive individual himself. Uh, but yeah, you, when you think about what a freewheeling place Key West is these days, it's hard to believe. But yeah, th that that thought process was still very much alive back then. They had a jam session with pianist Lofton Coffee Butler broken up at four in the morning. This is another example of the Beatles, uh, you know, uh, loving American music and trying to get as immersed in Amer American music as they could. No doubt about it. And that was just an absolute thrill was to go down and meet with uh, Mr. Butler, um, I should say, during the height of COVID. And I'm wearing one of these, you know, huge mass and no, I don't want to you know <laughs> take a chance at infecting this Key West treasure he was over 90 at the time but he still had some wonderful memories of jamming with the Beatles back then and he entertained President Harry S. Truman and uh, you know I, I I'm very proud of being able to bring these first person stories into this book because a number of of these sources unfortunately have passed away since I've interviewed them, Coffee Butler being one of them, and there's no less than five or six others at this point who, who've passed on. And getting their first person accounts when I did was absolutely crucial. Our guest is Bob Keeling. His new book is called Good Day Sunshine State, How the Beatles Rocked Florida. We also have on the line Harlan Brown, the curator of Penny Lane, the ultimate Beatles museum in Dunedin. And we're going to um, wrap up our part in Key West before we go back to Jacksonville with this very touching story from Paul and John that night after the the jam session was broken up at four in the morning. It sounds it seems like Paul and John got together and just had a talk and cry session. And 
the the great thing about this for radio is that Paul later talked, he, he wrote a poem to John after John died. And then he talked about that poem and about this evening in Key West with Terry Gross on Fresh Air. Uh, so here's just a few, like a minute and 10 seconds or so of what Paul said happened in Key West, Florida in 1964, when he and John had a, a really touching uh, and moving conversation and a good cry after this all night jam session. At that age, with that much time on our hands, we didn't really know what to do with it, except get drunk. And so that was what we did. And we stayed up all night talking, talking, talking like it was going out of style. And at some point early in the morning, I think we must have touched on some points that were really uh, emotional. And we ended up crying which was very unusual for us because we members of a band and young guys, we didn't do that kind of thing. So I always remembered it as a sort of important emotional landmark. An important emotional landmark for the Beatles and for John Lennon and for Paul McCartney was in Key West, Florida in 1964, as Paul told Terry Gross in 2001. Uh, and it was, he also, Paul also wrote about that moment in a poem he wrote to John Lennon after John's death in 1980. You're listening to WMNF Tampa. This is the Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're speaking with Bob Keeling, whose new, new book is called Good Day Sunshine State, and Harlan Brown, who's the curator of the Penny Lane, the ultimate Beatles Museum in Dunedin. So maybe I could ask uh, Bob right now uh, that before we leave Key West and head back to a stormy Jacksonville, what uh, what what about Paul and John's moment there in Key West, Florida is historic and, and important for Beatles fans? Well, it was so historic. I actually named the chapter title An Emotional Landmark. Uh, just because they had the chance, you know, uh, true, it was fueled by alcohol, but, you know, they're young men and time on their hands, as Sir Paul said. And one of the things that's really interesting, too, is that um, they both lost their mothers young. And as it turns out, so did Larry Kane, the reporter who was with them on that tour. And he had a chance to bond with them because of that sense of loss. And I think um, th that really shows, uh, you know, the Beatles, here they are just getting world fame and they're rich. But when they found out that Larry had just lost his mother before he went on the tour with them, I think really bonded him to them quite a bit more. And, and they were uh, sincerely interested in, in asking him how he was doing. And Larry even said, you know, at the time I was sort of masking my feelings uh, about what had happened. Um, his mom died from MS and he's only 21 years old. And then he has to leave at her urging, by the way, to go on the tour. So um, it, it was just a lot of things going on. And Key West, you know, for having been there two and a half days, boy, it was uh, a watershed time for them, too. In fact, John even squeezes in a shoot for Cosmo magazine. Because they're thinking, hey, this this young Beatle may be the one who has staying power. <laughs> it's a solo artist, which sounds ridiculous these days. But yeah, so uh, a lot was going on down there. That's the voice of Bob Keeling, whose new book is called Good Day, Sunshine State, How the Beatles Rocked Florida when they were here in 1964. And let me turn now to Harlan Brown, the curator of the Penny Lane, Muse the ultimate Beatles museum in Dunedin. And, and Harlan, uh, uh, I sorry, I just muted you, Harlan. <laughs> um, there you go. What what are your thoughts about the Beatles in Key West and maybe this emotional moment between John Lennon and Paul McCartney? Well, they uh, well from what I understand, they um, they didn't realize uh, at that point what uh, how bad the storm actually was and didn't find out until they got back up there. Um, uh, but that. Being able to interact with all the other musicians that were on the tour, uh, the Bill Black combo and and uh, Jackie DeShannon, I, I think was there as well, the, uh, Frogman Henry. Um, they, it was wonderful for them to to be with their the people and play because they had no other time to do anything but drink and play. Um, it was it was great exposure for them, and and from what I've what I've read, it, they were very very kind, easygoing guys. 
they were they were considerate of of all other people and uh so that was that was a great break for them um and uh, just as a quick aside if i can uh, you mentioned dallas and someone had come into the museum at one point and and mentioned a story about the beatles going to a farm after they played in dallas um in arkansas uh because they did get those breaks occasionally um and they loved interacting with with people at that point that's harlan brown the curator of penny lane the ultimate beatles museum in pinellas county it's in the town of dunedin and you're listening to tuesday cafe i'm sean canan broadcasting from the studios of wmnf well, they did head back to Jacksonville right after Dora made landfall, Hurricane Dora, uh, early morning, Thursday, September 10th, about, what, 36 or 40 hours before the they were scheduled to take the stage at the Gator Bowl. The landfall was between St. Augustine and Jacksonville. Uh, the sustained winds were 125 miles an hour. So that led to some fans not being able to make the trek. It was just too dangerous to go. Uh, for example, Tom Petty's mom did not let him drive from Gainesville to Jacksonville. There were 10,000 no-shows. There were 20, 23,000 fans that did make it. And one notable thing about the, um, the, the Jacksonville gig is that unlike many of the other shows on tour, during the opening bands, which were largely, uh, there were many African-American performers, there were no racial slurs hurled at them at the Jacksonville gig. So Bob, what is the significance of that and what might have attributed to this kind of almost change of heart? Well, and Harlan made a really good point that the Beatles had, had really become friends with the others on the tour. They didn't act like, oh, we're the headliners and you're not. And, and my book, I'm lucky enough to have interviewed Reggie Young from the Black Combo and Lillian Walker from the Exciter. So these are first person accounts of people who were there. And, um, you know, in other places in America, unfortunately, there were some very serious slurs hurled at, at the Exciters trying to open up for the Beatles. But yeah, not in, not in Jacksonville. As it turned out, because of this judge's courageous decisions and basically throwing down the gauntlet just a few weeks earlier and saying, look, we have a civil rights act now. And, and uh, if you think you're going to cross the line here in my jurisdiction, you got another thing coming. So it, as it turned out what the exciters were worried about in terms of what kind of reception they were going to get in, you know, it was stormy in Northeast Jacksonville and not just because of the weather, you know, you had talked about St. Augustine and they worried about the Klan and they worried about how fans would receive them. But like Larry Hayes said, it turned out to be a beautiful night in terms of the reception and being able to play. And it was also fun to interview the promoter's daughter who talked about all of the challenges that her family had to face just to put that show on while there's still essentially a tropical storm going through there to the point Ringo's like, you better, you know, nail down my drum kit because I don't want to, you know, fall off me Risa, you know, being blown off there in all the weather. So uh, you know, their trip through Florida was just amazing. And that's why with, with my book, Good Day Sunshine State, there's more than 200 pages of narrative because this is a meaty story as they make their way through the Sunshine State. And they, meant they, 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 they spent more time here in Florida by far than anywhere else in North America in 64. And you did speak with Kitty Oliver, who was a, a young black high school student who saved up her money, took a taxi by herself to the previously segregated uh, Gator Bowl in Jacksonville. And then afterwards, she met a couple of other black young young people who were surprised that she went alone. Yeah, they're like, what? You were here alone? And, and But I also interviewed um, white folks who had been there, one of them uh, from Tampa, a woman named Margaret Shepard. And when I told her about Kitty Oliver's experience, she goes, you got yes, wonderful. Well, uh, Margaret's great. And she was there. She was right there on the field. And she goes, my God, kudos to Kitty. Uh, you know, to me, it was just a sea of white faces. And to know that she had the courage and the love of the Beatles and the band to do that really showed that a, that a new day was dawning. And uh, kudos to the Beatles and Judge Simpson and the others who encouraged to make it happen.
And bringing Harlan back in, Harlan, what can you say about the Beatles and about the civil rights movement? Is there anything that maybe even outside of Florida or, or anything we should know about the Beatles and kind of um, this tumultuous time in America and, and this outsider perspective? Um, well, I, my perspective is uh, that that they were all about peace and love. They really, they didn't just say it. They believed it, uh, and and they wanted to make a difference if, in in the world. Uh, and and the the wonderful thing about working in this museum is that people from everywhere, all over the world, countries and of all ethnicities, uh, they all come in here and they all smile because they love the Beatles. Uh, and I have great conversations with people because they. They were fans of the Beatles back, you know, older folks who were fans of the Beatles back in the 60s who, uh, who were um, black people in Florida. And they didn't expect uh, that it was, you know, that the Beatles would be so, so uh, uh, powerful in changing the culture. That's Harlan. Brown, curator of Penny Lane, the Ultimate Beatles Museum in Dunedin. We're also speaking with Bob Keeling, author of a new book called Good Day Sunshine State about the Beatles in Florida in 1964. So we've heard about the Beatles in Jacksonville and in uh, Key West and in Miami Beach in 1964. But Bob, let's jump ahead for our last anecdote to about a decade from 1964 to another Florida connection with the Beatles. What role does the Polynesian Village Resort at Walt Disney World play in the end of the Beatles? Yeah, it's uh, amazing to think that John signed the documents to actually dissolve the band he started at Disney World. Uh, it's amazing to think that's where, at least technically on paper, the band ended was back here in Florida, but indeed that was the case. And thank goodness that at the time he was with Payne, who documented this uh, momentous event through uh, photographs. And, you know, she, she's a very insightful person herself. Um, she was with John at the time. And then the next day they went down to West Palm and um, John, when he was with Yoko, uh, even bought a mansion, bought a house down there. So there's just so many aspects to the Beatles time in Florida. And, and in the last chapter, without giving things away, with making it more of a tease, I have encounters with both living Beatles, which is wonderful. And you kind of get a sense of where we are with Beatlemania in Florida now, 60 years on. And uh, what a thrill that was. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a wonderful story. And uh, it, it, it was great to put together. And uh, I take great pride in this book. It, it was a joy to write. Well, I want to thank you for coming on WMNF's Tuesday Cafe, Bob Keeling, the author of a new book called Good Day, Sunshine State, How the Beatles Rocked Florida. It's published by the University Press of Florida. And Bob will be speaking at Florida Southern University, or is it Florida Southern College in Lakeland, March 16th. And he will also be at the St. Pete Museum of History on April 13th. So thank you for coming on, Bob. And Harlan Brown is the curator of Penny Lane, the ultimate Beatles Museum in Dunedin, Florida, which is in Pinellas County. So thank you very much, both of you, for coming on the show today. Thank you. Thanks, Harlan. The museum looks fantastic. Come and visit. <laughs> okay, will do. And thank you, Sean. Thanks to both of you. I really appreciate you coming on. I had a fun time talking about the Beatles today. And as a reminder that if you like the Beatles, WMNF is organizing a tribute to the Beatles. It's on March 25th in Tampa, and you can get tickets at WMNF.org. Well, thanks to our phone screener, John Dunn. You've been listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, News and Public Affairs Director at WMNF Tampa. We'll be back next Tuesday at 10 with a brand new show. During this time slot tomorrow, Shelly Reback will host Midpoint on International Women's Day. Next up is Wavemakers with Janet and Tom Sherberger. For Women's History Month, they'll talk about the important role that women have played in historic preservation. Their guests will be Linda Salsena, the former Tampa City Council member, and Jane Hernandez, who is working to maintain and restore the iconic Plant Hotel. This is Tuesday Cafe, coming to you live on March 7th, 2023, from the studios of WMNF in Tampa, St. Petersburg, Sarasota, Lakeland, and beyond. Thanks so much for listening, and thanks to everyone who contributed to WMNF.org. You can still make a contribution. Thank you.